right, we continue moving on in our um, progress through the scriptures, and uh, because all scripture is ultimately about Jesus, um, it's all good Christmas text, uh, especially as we look here at King Solomon and uh, what he meant to God's people, uh, the son of David, King Solomon, literally the son of David, King Solomon and what David's uh, sons beyond Solomon, Solomon's son and grandson, etc., would mean to God's people. Uh, ultimately, this has meaning in Jesus, because Jesus is, lo and behold, the son of David, uh, born in the city of David in Bethlehem, where David had been born. So we look at 1 Kings uh, chapter 9, verses 1 through 10. This is God's word eternally true. When Solomon had finished building the temple of the Lord in the royal palace and had achieved all he had desired to do, the Lord appeared to him a second time as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. The Lord said to him, I have heard the prayer and plea you have made before me. I have consecrated this temple, which you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there as for you, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and uprightness, as David your father did, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. But if you or your sons turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you, and go off and serve other gods and worship them. Then I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. And though this temple is now imposing, all who pass by will be appalled and will scoff and say, why has the Lord done such a thing to this land and to this temple? People will answer, because they have forsaken the Lord their God, who brought their, for their fathers out of Egypt, and have embraced other gods, worshiping and serving them. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. We'll end there. There's our, the end of our reading, the word of the Lord. Thanks indeed. Let's pray. We begin our uh, Christmas season here. And, uh, you know, Christmas and Easter are always challenging for pastors because they're very small texts, you know, that come up every year. Uh, but as I mentioned before we read this text, uh, all, all passages are about Jesus. We looked at that in Sunday school this morning. We see that in Luke 24. That's what Jesus teaches his disciples. That scripture from its very beginning, the book of Genesis to the very last prophet, Malachi, is all speaking of him. And as we get to these texts and here in 1 Kings, a text about the king and, and what he meant to his people. Uh, the son of David and David's sons and grandsons and great-grandsons and what they would mean for God's people. This is good news and this is the gospel for us. Now as we talk about this uh, related to being the king, I got a side point for you which is your point number one. And if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline you can go ahead and start with that. Uh, but just in, in light of our current context but also through church history we've seen this as well. This needs to be said. Here's our side point number one. The Lord doesn't speak to you. The Lord doesn't speak to you. Okay, now be alarmed and, be, and rejoice all at once. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, this for just a moment. Uh, why doesn't the Lord speak to you? That is audibly. Uh, you've all heard people say, and maybe you've said it yourself, like I've said it myself, well, the Lord just spoke to my heart and I knew I needed to do, and then they named some very specific thing that's not in the Bible, okay? Um, here's why we know the Lord doesn't speak to you, your number or your A there, because you're not the king. God speaks to Moses face to face. 
He appears to Solomon because Solomon's the son of David. He speaks with Jesus because Jesus is the king. He speaks to his prophets and you're none of those. Okay? And I'm none of those. I've never heard God's voice audibly and neither will you until you see him face to face. Okay? Um, so uh, just think about that. Um, now it doesn't mean that God doesn't communicate to you. And, and so number B there, but he does speak to you by the words of the Bible. He does speak to you by the words of the Bible. God got in scripture, uh, this book here, everything you need to know for life and godliness. That's what he says to us in 2 Peter 1. Everything we need to know for life and godliness, not how to do brain surgery, uh, not how to fix your car, not how to hit a baseball, but everything you need to know for life and godliness is in this book. So don't put spiritual antennae up and expect, expect a special message from Jesus telling you whether to um, take the shot or pass the ball, telling you which job you should take right now. But look to Scripture to understand who he wants you to be and how he wants you to act. And then ask those questions on your various circumstances in life. Uh, okay, God wants me to be a father to my kid, to, to instruct my kids in the ways of the Lord and not to exasperate them. We know these things from the Bible. And so if I'm considering a job I could take and it's going to mean that I'm out of town 364 days a year, I know that that would be disobedient and it's not the Lord's will for me. Because then I can't teach my children in the ways of the Lord. I can't guide and instruct them. I'll exasperate them because they'll, they will grow up not being, not being instructed. Okay, so, so God teaches us, you know, Scripture's there, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. I've listed that for you there. God teaches us. He, he corrects us. He rebukes us. He trains us in how to live. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. He gives us words, Psalm 19, that are sweet to us. Acts 20, 32, Paul says to the elders of Ephesus, here's what I entrust you to, the word of grace, which is able to give you salvation and build you up. So be Bible-centered people and be people who are not expecting a specific word from God on a specific circumstance in your life. If you want to know what to do in specific circumstances of your life, Know the Bible, because then you'll know what Jesus is like. You'll know his commands and what you're responsible for in your life, and you can follow those things. So God speaks to you in that way, but he doesn't speak to you like he speaks to Solomon the king. He doesn't speak to you like he speaks to Isaiah when he shows him heaven. He doesn't speak to you like he speaks to Moses, who's up on Mount Sinai, and experiencing the presence, the direct presence of God there. Okay, so that's our side point there. Just notice, this is the king that God is speaking to. The one who is the precursor of Jesus, the son of David. Okay? Um, number two. Number two. Now on with our, on with our passage. Uh, this passage, uh, we, we've read about that David wanted to build a temple for the Lord, 2 Samuel 7. And God says, nope, not you, David. Uh, David gathers all the materials for the temple, but he's not the temple builder. But now Solomon, with all the materials that David gathered, has built the temple. And 1 Kings 8 is this big long prayer of Solomon dedicating the temple. And God references this prayer in, in 1 Kings 9 here and says, I've heard your prayer. And, and God gives Solomon answer here. And, and that's what this passage is about, uh, what we should think about the temple. And so here's your point, respect the church. Respect the church. Um, first first uh, Corinthians 3.16 and other passages as well, our, our Ephesians 2 uh, passage this morning tells us that the church is the temple of God. The church is the temple of God. Um, and so we respect it.
uh, just like the temple was respected by God's people. And like it would be a tragedy for God's people to see the temple destroyed, as God references here in 1 Kings 9, um, we're to see that the, the church's destruction and harm coming to the church, the temple of today, would be a great tragedy. Tragedy. Okay, so respect the church. Um, why? Um, A, in your outline there. Because it's the house, the church is the house, his son, the son of David, Jesus has built. Okay, Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, and I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. Why do you respect the church? Because Jesus built the church. He built the church by preaching the gospel through his people for 2,000 years now. He's built this building, so to speak. The church is the temple of God because it's the place where God dwells by his spirit. And Jesus has been building this for 2,000 years. So, okay, so just as you were, if you were an Old Testament Israelite, you should respect the temple because the son of David built it. So you should respect the church today because the son of David built it. But a different son of David, the son of David, Jesus, born in Bethlehem, the town of David. Okay. Um, the, church is, the church is the temple. Now, 1 Peter 2 that... Uh, um, Bob read for us this morning, speaks about us. We're living stones in this house that Jesus is building. Jesus himself is the cornerstone, and we're living stones. We're, we're in this picture. We're the walls of the temple. And every time a new believer comes along, a new living stone is added, and the walls of the temple get higher and higher. And uh, Paul says in Ephesians 2 that this, these stones are housing God himself by his Spirit that the fullness of God would dwell within. And we know as believers, as we come, as people who individually have the Holy Spirit in us, 1 Corinthians 6, 19, that when we come together, the Holy Spirit is here in, in, in great presence when we gather together because the Holy Spirit is in each believer. So we respect the temple. The Old Testament, we respect the temple because Jesus built it. It's his house. You don't come in his house and, and uh, dirty up his living room rug. Okay? You respect it. If you're called to his house to admire it, you go over there and admire it. If he builds a new addition and says, hey, come over here and see this new addition I just built. You go over there and you see the new addition he just built and say, this is fantastic. Okay? We respect the church because it's the building of Jesus. Second thing, B, we respect the church because God has consecrated it. God has consecrated it. Uh, number, verse, verse 3 there. Now you see that there? He says, I have consecrated this temple. God hasn't consecrated uh, the New York Mets. God hasn't consecrated Riverwood Middle School. God hasn't consecrated the parking lot out here. God hasn't consecrated your Christmas tree. God hasn't consecrated Last Christmas by George Michael. We all know that. But God has consecrated the church. He set it apart. He's made it clean and holy and special. Consecrated it. You get to go someplace that's been consecrated by Jesus himself. That doesn't happen when you step in the food lion. But when you step into the church, when you're with God's people, you're in a consecrated place and you have no other time in your life that you step into a place that's consecrated until you die and are in heaven. And that's consecrated too. So respect the church because God has consecrated it. And he hasn't consecrated any other thing on earth that you can go to. Third thing, C, respect the church because he dwells there. Respect the church because he dwells there. Again, verse, verse 3. Jesus says, or, or the Lord says to Solomon, he says, I have consecrated this temple which you have built, son of David's built, by putting my name there forever. Now, here's a little bit of code. You know the code, elf fans. Here's a little bit of code for you in the Old Testament. 
whenever God mentions his name, he's speaking of his presence. And that's why all these passages talk about, I'm putting my name there. He's talking about putting his presence there. When he builds the temple, and part of what Solomon prays in 1 Kings 8, is that this is the place, God, you told us beforehand, you were going to put your name somewhere in the promised land. And now here it is, in Jerusalem, in the temple. And this is a reference and a connection to the fact that the Ark of the Covenant was in the temple. And with the Ark of the Covenant was the special presence of God. And nobody could have access to that special presence of God except the high priest once a year after he had consecrated himself. But we respect the temple if we're Old Testament Israelites because God dwells there. And we respect the church because this is the place where Jesus dwells. Again, Jesus doesn't dwell in, in Ohio Stadium. He doesn't dwell in Carter Finley. He doesn't dwell in, in uh, Riverdale Elementary. He dwells in the church. The church is his temple. And he's the ark. And his spirit and glory is among us, living among us. And so while other things are, are profane in life, the church is not, because Jesus dwells there. Okay? If you um, step into the presence of, of uh, some uh, uh, great person like the President of the United States, well, that's a bad example, right? Because we don't like any of our presidents, right? Uh, but if there's somebody of, of great stature who's in a room and you, and you come in and he's given a lecture and you don't realize he's there, and you come in and you're loud and, you're, uh, and, and then you step into the room, what do you do? All of a sudden, you get quiet because you realize someone great is here. Someone great is dwelling in this place. So we respect the church because Jesus dwells here. Um, it's the place where he has put his name, a Christian church. He's put his name. Christ is named on that church. D, D. We respect the church because it's no ordinary human institution. It's the only institution on earth in which God has promised to be present in his special blessing, blessing presence. Um, and that's not given anywhere else on earth, so we respect it. We don't uh, treat the church below uh, any school, any team, any workplace, or any building. Um, you know, if, if any of us went to literal Jerusalem today over in Israel and we came to the place and they said, well, this is the temple and here's this wall over here that's a remnant of the temple there, we would all feel this sense of, of reverence and respect, even though God's spirit departed from there when Jesus last left, you know, and said, I, you'll not see me here again until you see, learn to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And nobody has said that. Okay? He left. God in his glory, God by his spirit, left the temple when Jesus walked out that day. But we would still feel some kind of reverence, reverence for it because it was at one time, it was at one time a place that was special to God. And we recognize that with the church. The church is no ordinary human institution. It's no ordinary, it, it, it's a part, it's separate from, it's holy, set apart from every institution uh, on the earth. Next, E, we respect the church because it's what God has his eyes and heart on forever. You see that in verse three there? Um, By putting my name there forever, my eyes and heart will always be there. Now, there's a transition in this, of course, because God's eyes and heart were upon his, the physical temple and physical Jerusalem until Jesus showed up in John 2. He said, I'm the temple. And God the Father's eyes and heart were upon his son. And now we're part of the body of Christ. We're part of his temple, his body. We're all members of his body, right? 1 Corinthians 12. And God's eyes and heart are upon us. And the church is where God sets his affection, his eyes and his heart. 
He doesn't set his eyes and heart upon the United States of America. He doesn't set his eyes and heart upon Great Britain. He doesn't set his eyes and heart upon your favorite sports team. He doesn't set his eyes and hearts upon your company that you work for, or your school, or wherever it is. He sets his eyes and heart upon the temple. And we, the church, are the temple of God. God's affection, his eyes, his care is upon the church. And so we respect it. All right. Number three. So in view of, of two and A through E here, view of the fact that the church is like no other place. God's eyes and heart are here. It's no ordinary human institution. He's consecrated it. He dwells here. It's built by the son of David, Jesus himself. Here's the action point for us. Come, come unfailingly to the church. And this is weaved through or woven through this passage here. We don't treat the church as something we can participate in if there's nothing better to do and we're just kind of bored. Okay. Um, God said here in this passage, that's a recipe for destruction. That's a recipe for, for getting knocked out of the promised land. That's a recipe for the, the temple being in ruins. If, if worshiping me is not your primary priority, if you are going after other gods, whether those gods be idols, physical idols, or whether they just be other interests of your life, like in the parable of the soils, right? other things you're interested in, like the weedy soil, or you're interested in not being persecuted like the rocky soil, it, you know, if, that, if that's a part of, of how we think, then we're, we're aimed in the wrong direction. God says, rather, here's your source of blessing. Come unfailingly, unfailingly to the church. Why do we come unfailingly to the church? A, because Jesus dwells in the church. Okay, again, verse 3, he's put his name there. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3.16, Ephesians 2. This is where Jesus is. Um. As I mentioned, the temple is the place where God's presence is, symbolized by the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Uh, and, and God says to us here, essentially, don't say you love God unless you care about being with me. Okay? If you don't care about being in my presence, don't, don't bother. Don't bother saying you love me. Um, unless you care about experiencing his presence, um, which is here in the church more than in your house or car or the grocery store or parking lot, come unfailing to, unfailingly to the church. It's a place where Jesus dwells on earth. Uh, come to be with him. That's what the Magi say in Matthew 2.2. 2. It's referenced for you there. They come to, to see this king. They're excited about him. Um, Luke uh, 2.15, the shepherds hear this news and say, they say, come, let's see, let's go. And be where Jesus is. And that's instructive to us. We always want to be where Jesus is. We want to come unfailingly to be, to be with him. Yeah, you know, I, I remember in, in earlier days when I was unmarried and, and had uh, different girlfriends through the, through the years. And I remember one time uh, at the front end of this before I, a girlfriend was a girlfriend of mine. And I saw she was walking home. And so I was walking home too. So rather than just uh, run up to her next to her and say hi, um, I knew where her house was and it was on the way to my house. And so I cut through all these yards, um, backyards and all this stuff because I knew there was this particular alley that would come out like where she would be. And so I'm going through all these briars and stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> was sneaking through back the backyard, that kind of thing. And then, you know, I'm kind of running along like this, and then I get to that alley, and then I, like, casually just, you know, walk there, and there she is coming along. Oh, hey. So I could walk with her the rest of the way home. Um, that's the BS with Jesus. Um, come on, Phil. Go, go to be with. Go to be with the, the person you love. Okay? Actually, be excited about that. 
Yeah, I get to go be in the presence of the person I love today in this great way with all these people who, who uh, have God's spirit uh, within them. Okay, so we're excited about the church. We come and failing to it because Jesus dwells here. And when we're in the store, it's not like that. Okay, now God is everywhere, but he dwells especially in his blessing presence in the church. B, B, we come unfailingly to the church because your spiritual well-being is dependent on it. We come unfailingly to the church because your spiritual well-being is dependent on it. Um, so not only are, are we appreciative that God dwells with us in the church, and, and that was the great curse of the exile when God's people, as is referenced here in this passage, are cast off into Babylon, they couldn't be, they couldn't go to the temple and be where God dwelled especially. But also, we're supposed to recognize that our spiritual well-being depends on our being in the temple and our being faithful, faithful to the church. Verses 6 and 7 and, and verse 9, if you look there in verse 6, but if you or your sons turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I've given you and go off and serve other gods and worship them. In other words, you don't care about the temple. You don't come into the temple to worship me. You just kind of fade out in your interest and you go away and serve other gods and worship them. He says then, verse 7, I will cut off Israel from the land I have given them and will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. Israel will then become a byword and an object of ridicule among all peoples. You won't be doing well spiritually if you neglect the church. Okay? You neglect this place where Jesus dwells. Um, you need input. All six days you're getting input from other sources. And you need to be refreshed every week to get input, to get input from God to be refreshed, and if you neglect this, you wind up with this horrible circumstance there, with a, a disaster uh, there coming upon you. Your, your spiritual well-being is dependent, is dependent on your coming unfailingly to the church. Um, Old, Te Old Testament Israel, if you were an Old Testament Israelite without the temple, that was a rough, that was a rough thing. It meant you weren't doing well spiritually. Uh, God's people, the presence of God's people in whom Christ dwells, you need it. Um, Hebrews 10, 25 says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together, especially as the day of Jesus coming back approaches. But encourage one another. Paul tells us, encourage one another and build each other up. And that happens when we're here in the temple, when we see other people who believe in Jesus, in whom the Holy Spirit dwells, we're encouraged, our hearts are encouraged, and we say, yes, he's following Jesus, she's following Jesus, I can do that, I can do that too. This is the place where we hear the gospel, where it's preached and it's taught. So we come because we need this. We need a reminder of the, the, the sacrifice that has been made for us in Jesus, just like God's people in Old Testament Israel would get that reminder that God cared for them and had taken care of their sins through the sacrificial system there. You need this for if you have kids, for your kids. They need this instruction so things go well with them in their life and so that by your unfaithfulness, they don't wind up in Babylon, so to speak. They don't wind up outside the church. So let me tell you something you already know. When you're in the church, you see people who are acting like Jesus, whose character is affected by Jesus, who have certain characteristics of Jesus just kind of flowing out from them, from whom they are. And you don't have that outside the church. So to grow, to be more like Christ, you need the church. Your spiritual well-being depends on it. This is your source. Uh, it's like, as I mentioned recently, you know, this is where you eat, this is where you drink, this is where your soul gets filled and is nourished. Okay, third thing, C, come unfailingly to the church because life outside the church continued. That is, if you continue living outside the church, it eventually means disaster 
in your life. And that's what we see in verse 9 there. Look down to verse 9. What happens to God's people when they let uh, the temple not be important to them? Or us when we let the church not be important to us? Uh, Non-believers go by and they see a disaster-ridden life, which has become us. And they say, I thought this person was a believer. I thought this person was a Christian. What went on? And people will answer verse 9, because he forsook the Lord his God, who brought his fathers out of Egypt. He embraced other gods. He had other interests that were more important to him than Jesus, worshiping and serving those other interests. That is why the Lord brought all this disaster on them. We can experience God's discipline because he's a loving father to us. And God doesn't want to exercise that discipline on us. He wants us just simply, just simply to obey. Um, Revelation 3, 15 and 16, Jesus speaks about, we're talking about it in Sunday school now, um, that we can become lukewarm. And when we're lukewarm, Jesus says, ah, I think I'll spit you out of my mouth. Um, and when we're spit out of his mouth, we're outside of the church. Uh, but Jesus loves and rebukes he rebukes and disciplines those, those he loves. So he does that. So life, if you live your life not prioritizing Jesus, not prioritizing the house he built, not prioritizing knowing him, what you get to do when you're in here, um, not prioritizing how he wants, knowing how he wants you to be and who he wants you to be. Um, if you're not in the place where your elders can care for you and and teach you and instruct you and give you advice, um, then the word here in verse 9 is disaster. And God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that for you. Um, so if you're young in the faith and not really sold out to the Lord yet, God is gracious. Uh, God didn't uh, bring exile to his people right away. Um, they kind of got unexcited about the church or the temple for a while and he's gracious to them. Uh, but there comes a time where eventually, as the prophets come one after another after another, he says, hey, come on, i got to have a response here sometime. And when he gets no response, when they continue to live their life outside of prioritizing the temple, then all of Israel gets destroyed, and the temple gets flattened, and they're living outside the land, and they've become a byword to the nations. And so this passage is a warning to us as believers that, that we never want to get in that place where we're outside the church. We don't, never want to get to that place where we're, we're not uh, prioritizing being there because disaster will come on our lives. Okay? Fourth thing. Fourth thing. Understand the importance of your king. So we've talked about the temple here, and God talked to Solomon about the importance of the temple. I will dwell there. I'll be there. I've consecrated it. It's the place my people will be blessed. Now we talk about why the king, why Solomon, why Jesus is so important to us. So understand the importance of your king, Jesus, to your presence, that's your blank, to your presence among God's people now and in eternity. And we read about this in verses 4 through 7, and you can look there. How important is the king to you? If you're an Israelite, how important is Solomon and Solomon's faithfulness how important are the descendants of David who are kings and their faithfulness? How important is that to you? And for us, how important is the faithfulness of Jesus, our king, the son of David, to us? And this is all good news. This is gospel stuff. A, his importance. So here we go. Your membership in the church now and eternally, your presence in the promised land, is not by, here's the good news, it's not by, your faithfulness, your presence among God's people now in the church and when you die in heaven and when Jesus comes back in the new heavens and new earth is not dependent upon you and your faithfulness. That's not what verses 4 through 7 teach. That's not what 2 Samuel 7 had taught. That's not what Noah teaches either. It's not dependent on your faithfulness, but it's dependent on the faithfulness of your, guess what, of your king, 
See that there in this passage? Your presence in the promised land. You're having a temple that's up and functioning and having sacrifices so that your sins are forgiven is dependent on the faithfulness, not of you, but of your king. Look there, verse 4. As for you, Solomon, if you walk before me in integrity of heart and righteousness as David your father did and do all I command and observe uh, and do... Sorry, and do all I command and observe my decrees and laws. I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall not fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Then what looks, look at what happens when the king isn't faithful. Next verse. But if you or your sons turn away from me and do not observe the commands and decrees I have given you, in other words, if the faithfulness of the king is bad, if the king is unfaithful, if he goes off and serves other gods and worships them, what will happen? Does it happen just to him? No. Verse 7. Look down there. Verse 7. Then I will cut off Israel. Everybody loses. I will cut off Israel from the whole land. The land I've given them, and I will reject the temple. You won't have sacrifices for your sins. And I won't be present there. That temple that I consecrated for my name. Israel. All of Israel will become a byword. Where does it start? With the unfaithfulness of Solomon. With the unfaithfulness of the sons of David. With the unfaithfulness of the king. You see, your presence in the promised land depends on how faithful your king is. Your presence in the church. Your presence in heaven. Your presence in the new heavens and new earth depends on the faithfulness of your king. And that is good news because if you're honest, you're like me and you say, I am glad my presence in the church and my going to heaven is not dependent on my faithfulness because my faithfulness is far short from perfect obedience to God in thought, word, and action, in deed, and attitude. This is good news. This is the gospel. Again, I, you, you know I, I love the game of life the Milton Bradley game. And when you don't have enough money at the end of that game and you're looking around, you know, at all the guys that are playing with you and, and you see that you don't have enough money to win the game, which that's how you win the game of life. You have the most money at the end. He who dies with the most toys wins. What do you do? You try to become a millionaire tycoon. And you put all your money, all the cash, all your insurance policies, your stock certificate, your car, with you, your spouse, and your kids, and you put it all on one number and you spin the wheel. That's the gospel. You say, Jesus is number five, and I'm putting everything on it. And I believe this wheel spin will come up on five. That's the gospel. We'll make a bet. Bet on Jesus. It's going to turn out. Okay? You don't say, hey, I'm getting into heaven because I have enough money. Because my faithfulness is good enough. I'm getting into heaven because I've placed everything on Jesus. I'm getting into heaven because my king has been faithful. The temple will be up and running. Sacrifices will be made because my king is faithful. I'll get to be in heaven because my king is faithful. I won't be a byword because my king is faithful. B. This is why Jesus' proclamation of the good news, that's your blank, this is why Jesus' proclamation of the good news is not receive me into your heart and I'll forgive your sins. What's his proclamation of the good news? His proclamation of the good news over 120 times in the New Testament, the proclamation of the good news is that the kingdom of God was near. The good news is that anybody who wants Jesus as their king can be part of the kingdom of God. And what have we just learned here from this text? If you're part of the kingdom of God and your king is faithful, how's it going for you? It's going really well. Good news. The kingdom of God was near. Why was the kingdom of God near? Because Jesus knew he was going to a cross and he was going to take his throne at the right hand of God. The kingdom of God was near. He was commencing it 
by coming to earth and by preaching and by building a resistance against him for three years so he would go to a cross bearing our sins. That's good news. Matthew 4, 23 that Bob read for you. What's Jesus preach? The good news that the kingdom of God was near. The good news is not that God will make you perfectly faithful in this life. The good news is not that God will declare you good enough. Eh, okay, he's in. The good news is that the king has arrived and the, the king is without sin. If the king is without sin, you stay in the promised land. If the king is without sin, the temple stays up and running and you have a sacrifice for your sins. The good news is the kingdom of God. See, Jesus was referring to the fact that he was king. The final God-appointed son of David king who was about to go to his coronation in the heavenly Jerusalem upon his ascension after the cross. And we see that scene in Revelation 5. C, he was, sorry, uh, D, this is the good news, the gospel, because. Okay, a little, those of you who like logic, here we got a little syllogism here going for you. Why is the, God, why is the, the good news the kingdom? Here's why. One, okay, premise one. Your presence in the promised land, which today is the church, which when you die is heaven, which when Jesus comes back is the new heaven and the new earth, your presence in the promised land depends on the faithfulness of your, what's verses 4 through 9 tell us? Of your king. Okay, your presence in the promised land depends on the faithfulness of your king. Verses 4 through 9. Two, then, if Jesus is your king by your faith in him, and three, since Jesus is ever faithful, okay, so we're, we're talking verses 4 and 5 here, he walks before his father in uprightness of heart, integrity of heart and uprightness, obeying all his decrees and laws. Then number four, if Jesus is your king by your faith in him, and since he's ever faithful, your presence in the promised land, being dependent upon your king's faithfulness, is assured. <laughs> this is it. This is the gospel. Any better news than this that you'll ever hear in your whole life? There's not. We've struck it rich. When you sin, you don't have to worry. If Jesus is your king, you're set. Right? Is it good news that a newborn king came? Why is everybody making an issue about Jesus being king? Because if there's a faithful king, you're in the promised land and you're not bothered. This is good news. See how this promise is fulfilled? Verse 5, I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. Today, Israel's the church. Okay, Romans 9, Galatians 6, Israel's the church. I will establish your royal throne over the church forever, as I promised David your father when I said, you shall never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Jesus is king, and that's it. There's no one who's ever going to succeed him. And he's always faithful. So we don't get knocked out. We don't get exiled from the promised land. Those of us who have made Jesus our king, who have come to him and say, Jesus, I need you to stay in the promised land. I'm not a great warrior. I can't overcome the Egyptians or the Babylonians or the Philistines. You know, I'm like one of those people in 1 Samuel 17. Goliath's threatening and I don't want to go out and fight him. I can't overcome death. I can't live a good enough life to earn heaven. But Jesus, I can put all you know, my money, my car, my life insurance policy, my stock certificate, all on you. And God spins the wheel and it shows up on five. I think Pat Sajak sometimes when he has, I, I think he can spin the wheel right where he wants to. Sometimes when he likes somebody, he, he gets that thousand dollars on that final spin. Uh, but God can do that. And that final spin of God is Jesus, okay? So is that good news? Yes, E, yes. Okay, five. Now what does this mean about our lives on earth? 
The good news is that the righteousness of the king gets us into heaven. The righteousness of the king keeps us in the church. The righteousness of the king uh, gets us in the new heavens and new earth. So what does this mean about our lives now? Um, that ask, question was asked of Paul as he wrote to the Romans. Uh, but here's what we'll say. Here's God's exhortation to you. Follow. Follow your king's faithfulness in life. And you see that in this text here too. One of the reasons that, that, that uh, things went well for Israel when there was a faithful king is because the king led his people in faithfulness. And there's this connection between faithful king and faithful Israelites. And when the king isn't faithful, the Israelites aren't faithful. And here's the good news. We have a faithful king. So what's that supposed to mean about us? That we're faithful because we follow our king and we're, we're like him. So as a member of the church, you follow the faithfulness of your king. Um, here, in this passage, it warns that a wicked king, a wicked son of David, verse 6, would result in a wicked people. In verse 9, uh, we would wind up uh, with uh, being cast out. But the opposite is true of that as well. So A, in your outline there, your presence in the promised land is dependent on Jesus' faithfulness, but this does not mean his citizens walk in sin. Rather, verse, verse 9 there um, here's the plea given in the negative. If you're reading this and you're an Israelite, you're saying, oh, I need to not forsake the Lord who brought my fathers out of Egypt. I need to not embrace other gods and worship and serve them. I need to embrace God alone, the God of heaven, who redeemed me out of Egypt, who redeemed my fathers out of, out of Egypt, and I need to serve him, and then the Lord won't bring disaster in my life. He won't discipline he won't discipline me. Okay? So our presence in the promised land is dependent on Jesus' faithfulness, but this does not mean his citizens walk in sin. Paul was asked the same question in Romans uh, 6 1. Uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace might increase? That's the question that Paul is, is offered. Shall we just continue in sin then? Because Jesus has covered all our sin. That's what he's just said at the end of chapter 5 of Romans. And the answer is quick, short, and clear. May it never be. May it never be. We're people who are like our king. We represent our king in what we do and we say, say and think and, and in how we act. So be rather, as a citizen of your faithful king, the normal, normal order is that you and all Christians, people with Jesus as their king, walk in faithfulness. 1 John 2, 3 through 6. Here's what it says. We know that we have come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not know what he commands is a liar and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys God's word, God's love is truly made complete in him. And then here's a good answer, a clear answer to our question here. This is how we know we are in Christ, in him. Whoever claims to, to live in him must walk as Jesus did. This is who we are, citizens of Jesus' kingdom. We're people who walk as he walked. So we as Jesus' people, with Jesus as our king, we walk as Jesus walked. And then C, live in a way that beautifies, that beautifies the church, not defiles it. Because again, going back to our first point, this is the building that Jesus has built um, we're living stones, 1 Peter 2, 4 through 5. We're living stones of its wall. We don't want to be the source, in other words, of outsiders, people outside the church, scoffing. See that word there in this passage? We don't want to walk in sin and experience the consequence of our sins and have people say, I thought he was a Christian. That doesn't mean we won't sin. But we don't want to walk away from him. We don't want to think that obedience to him is unimportant. We want to represent our king well. As stones of the temple wall, we want to be beautiful stones. Not sinful stones. Not stones that are taking vengeance on our enemies. Not stones that are being unkind. Not stones that are being unforgiving. We want to be beautiful people in our souls. We want to be people who are like Jesus 
in our character. So that people walk by the temple, people walk by the church, if you get this image here, as they're passing by Jerusalem and they look up and they say, wow, that's beautiful. We want to be the kind of people where when people see us out in society talking with one another, they think, wow, they're really good friends. There's a love between them. There's a kindness, a, a, a sense of lack of competitiveness between them, a sense of them kind of cheering each other on. That's who we want to be in the church. Beautiful. One, it's good for us when we're kind, uh, when we're loving, when we're forgiving to others, when we treat people with, with justice and, and respect. But two, we want to be that way. We want to be a beautiful living stone because it reflects on Jesus. When God's people were in exile in the Old Testament, which God foretells here in this passage, when people were going by the destroyed temple, God was defamed. And God, before all the nations, was embarrassed before them because his people were unfaithful to, to him. And the place where his presence was had meant nothing to them. So we live in contrast to that in a way that beautifies the church, in, the way, in a way that means Jesus building the church is more beautiful. Conclusion, just summarizing these things here. You as a Christian are called to a high view of the church. A high view of the church. Respecting the church for all these reasons. It's where Jesus dwells. It's where he's put his name. He's consecrated it. It's the house he's built. You're called to respect the church, to have a high view of it. And you're called to have a high view of Jesus. Just like if you were an Israelite under one of the son of David's, you were to have a high view of him because you knew your well-being depended on his faithfulness. You had a high view of him. You didn't take him lightly at all because your life depended on him. And we have a high view of Jesus because we understand our life and our eternal life depends upon him. So be grateful for your faithful king and come continually to be in his presence in the church, to know him, that's your blank, to know him and for your soul and for your soul to prosper. God's people prospered in Israel when they had a faithful king. We've read about it three of the last four weeks as we've uh, responsibly read Psalm 72. Reread re that. All the things that come on Israel when Israel has a faithful king are blessings. And blessing comes to us because of our king. And we have access and growth in our king as we come to his temple, the church. Let's pray.